Scripture. If you got your Bible, we're going to uh, look at uh, the main passage of Scripture I want to look at today is Joshua chapter 1. And uh, we're going to start in verse number 8. If you've been here the past few weeks, we've been talking about mental health. Mental health is a big deal. It's one third of who you are is your soul, your mind, your will, your emotions, your conscience, your memories, all that type of stuff. And God didn't just send Jesus to die on the cross to get you into heaven. No, he put a crown on his head, a crown of thorns so that you could have freedom in your mind. He put stripes on your back so the other third part of you, you can have health and healing. He'll help you with your body. Healing comes different ways. There's miracles that happen with healing. You pray for somebody and miraculous. You know, there's gifts of faith, gifts of healing. But sometimes healing just means the Lord will prompt you on what to eat and what not to eat. And through that, he will preserve and keep you healing. Everybody hates that part of the message. They're like, wait, wait, wait. The Lord doesn't want, I can't just eat whatever I want. No, sometimes healing, the Lord will just help you. The Lord can send people. How many of y'all think the Lord can send a doctor, send somebody in your uh, life to catch something before it's too late? The the Lord, man, the Lord quicken. I I don't know about you, but I like that he's able to save by many or by few, and I'll take all of it. Lord, if it's by the Holy Spirit, if it's by a miracle, if it's by a doctor, God, whatever it takes he puts stripes on his back so that your body you can have help in your body region a crown so you can have help in this region your brain but ultimately uh, he died on the cross so that your spirit can have eternal life I'm y'all glad about that come on our life we just read your life is like a flower it's here today how many y'all know that flower fades how many y'all your flowers starting to fade one of the petals fell off Right, right. He's like, <laughs> he's like, two of my petals fell off. He got, got two petals off so far, right? So uh, the flower, it comes up. It's beautiful, right? How many of y'all know youth is beautiful? Yes, it is. It's so, it's so vibrant and everything's all tight. Woo! How many of y'all like it when it's all nice and tight? And then you start looking in the mirror and you're like, man, I think they can lift these things now. I think they can. I think they could fix some of this now. I think they could get a shot and they just give you big lips, all types of stuff. But the Lord, he wants to take care of your spirit, your soul, and your body. So we've been taking a few weeks and talking about your mental health or the part of you that's between your ears because the mind is, it's powerful. The mind is amazing. The mind has put people on an outer space. It's cured malaria. I mean, there's all, diff- all different things that your mind has done. But we kind of ended uh, a couple of weeks ago with, with where we're going these next few weeks that the most powerful part of you is not your mind. The most powerful part of you, James said that there's one part of your body that usurps authority over all the other parts, and that's your mouth. And this is all scientifically proven and all this stuff that now, you know, they'll have you do these exercises. Say ABC in your brain while you count with your mouth. And what's happening with your mouth usurps authority over or is more powerful than what's happening in your mind. So in other words, you can't count with one thing and then be doing ABCs in your brain. Your brain automatically, it becomes overtaken by what's happening in your mouth, right? And this is what science is telling us. But how many of y'all know Dr. James told us this thousands of years ago he said listen the tongue is a small tiny member but it usurps authority over all the other parts of the body the direction that your mouth goes that's the direction that your life goes he said your tongue is like a rudder of a ship and y'all know this he says like putting a bit in a horse's mouth you can turn it wherever you want and then he says and the tongue it's like a flame and it can set a blaze and if you know we just had the forest fires out in California and how many y'all know that that fire didn't start big No, some guy was camping and didn't put out his fire well enough and it burned some of the most beautiful real estate in our country, most valuable property. That fire swept across all of that real estate and burned it up. And how many of y'all know your mouth is the same way, right? Your pretty little cute little tongue, coochie coochie, right? In another moment, it can set some things on fire, right? I, I know I can make my wife hot as a, as a hornet, right? She gets so mad at me at some of the things I say, and I could set her ablaze, right? But on the same mind with my mouth, I can say some really nice things and get her hot in another way. She's like, oh, you're so handsome. You're so beautiful. And then that's because it's like, yeah, because I told you this, and I told you this, and I told you this, and I told you that. And then she's like, oh, you are the most handsome. I say, oh, thank you so much. I did all of that with my words, right? So with your words, 
words. The Bible says you can build up with your words. You can tear down with your words. You can burn things up or with your words. Your words are incredibly powerful. So we're going to take a few uh, weeks because, listen, as a Christian, I wasn't always a pastor. You know, I think people think that I was always a, a preacher or that... Uh, but, but I was not, had no interest in being a preacher, did not want to be a preacher, didn't want to be a pastor. In fact, I ran from it because I did not want to do it. Right? How many of you ever ran from the Lord before? He just, he chases you down. He's not interested in what you want to do all the time because he knows what's good for you, right? Just like your own kids. So the Lord pursued me, but I was not always, uh, you know, I didn't like come out of, uh, you know, like grow up, come out of my mom with like sprinkling people with holy water. You know, I think people think around the house that, that I like wear a robe or something and that, that I'm just like sprinkling. Listen, I eat my cereal in my underwear, <laughs> right? And Ansley will tell you, she's like, God, put some clothes on. I'm like, listen, it's my house. It's my house, right? You're just passing through. I live here, right? And your, mo your mother loves it, right? She, she, just, she loves this. <laughs> Say amen. Hey, man, there you go, right there, right there. Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, you know, there's no holy water getting sprinkled or whatever. Listen, we're just like you. There's nothing special about us. But there are certain things that I have learned uh, about being a Christian that move me from just being a smo. You know what a smo is? SMO stands for Sunday morning only. Uh, that's what we call SMOs. It's like a SMO is Sunday morning only. In, in other words, just, that, that just do church on Sunday morning only. Well, there, there came a part, where, a point of me to where it's like, no, I want to walk with the Lord and I want to learn. So the Lord uh, showed me different things. One of them is to walk in love. And walk in love is a learned skill. And walking in love means that I love or I'm learning to love the way God loves. Because there's human love and there's God love. Human love is called phileo. God's love is called agape. Human love, it changes, right? One day you like this and the next day you don't like this. One day you love somebody and the next day you don't love somebody. But the Bible says the moment you got saved that the love of God's been shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Ghost. And then he says, walk in love. And, and if you don't know what that looks like, he gave us 1 Corinthians 13 that says love is patient, love is kind. How many of y'all know human love is not always patient? Human love is not always kind. God kind of love agape believes the best in, in people, in imperfect people. So he gave us a definition of what love is. And then he says, walk in that love. I mean, y'all know that's a skill that you have to learn, right? Because it's hard to be patient, especially how to be patient with imperfect people. The Bible says love takes no thought for a suffered wrong. How I many of y'all know that doesn't come naturally, right? Because we, we run a ledger. And we can't wait for you to do something to us so that we can get you back, right? And some of us, we'll, we'll gather up our ammo, right? And then we're going to let you have it. We're going to give it to you real, like we're going to tear into you real good. So I learned, I had to learn, and I'm still learning how to walk in love. The next one, he said, walk in the spirit. He said, walk in the spirit and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. And he says, the flesh wars against the spirit and the spirit against the lust. And he says, you have to learn how to walk by the spirit. Walk by the spirit just means that you get cues from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will be like, do this, don't do that. Say this, don't say that. So learning to walk by the Spirit, that's a learned skill, right? And a SMO is somebody that's like, I'll just go to church, check it off my list, and then I'm gonna go about my way. But somebody that wants to follow the Lord, he says, I'm gonna teach you how to walk in love. When people are mean to you, I'm gonna teach you how to turn the other cheek. I'm gonna turn you how to, I'm gonna show you how to do that. And he says, I'm gonna teach you how to walk by the Spirit. Because if you just walk by your five senses, if it feels good, you'll do it. How I many of y'all know that'll get you in trouble? Try that in your marriage. You won't be married long, right? If you, if you just walk by your what tastes good or what you see, all of you in here have five senses. But they says those things war against the spirit. So if you're always listening to your senses, then they'll get you in trouble. So he says, hey, I'm going to teach you how to walk by the spirit. The third one is, is walking by faith. Walking by faith, the Bible says faith is now. Walk by faith and not by sight. So in other words, sight is just you are, you're blown by your circumstances. But walking by faith says, no, 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 I believe God. I believe his word. And I believe that what he says is greater than what I'm seeing. So I'm going to hook my faith up to what the word of God says. And he says, so I'm, I'm still learning how to walk by faith. 
and not by sight. I'm learning how to walk by the Spirit and not by the flesh. And I'm learning how to walk in love and not just do and say what I want to say to people. But the walk by faith part of it is what we're going to be talking about the next few weeks. Because walking by faith... This has to do with your mind and your mental faculties because the greatest weapon that you have to overcome what's going on in between your ears is underneath your nose. God's given you a supernatural weapon in your mouth, in your tongue, that will greatly affect if if things are going on in your mind that are not right. My dad, whenever my dad went, my dad had cancer and we would go to MD Anderson. And MD Anderson is the, the number one, you know, cancer place arguably in America. And we would go over there and it's a very, uh, very sad place to be if you've ever been. It's one of the saddest places I've ever been on the planet actually because the people there, they're really hopeless. And, and listen, there's different, there's hard parts of life. How many of y'all know life can be hard? There's parts of it that are difficult. They're hard to they're hard to deal with. They're hard to process. But I believe God gives God God wants to help you and I. God wants to work with us and wants to teach us and show us things because God wants to give you supernatural strength. God wants to give you supernatural guidance and supernatural help. One of the things whenever I was over there that I thought was fascinating is that uh, they they had learned that that people's Uh, what was happening in people's mind affected how the medicine worked. In other words, people that were mentally stronger or their countenance was different, that that the medicine would work different. So they would start these clinical trials, and my dad didn't do it. uh, Could have done it, I guess, but he didn't do it. But they they had these laughing rooms. So they would get the patients together, and they would all get in a room, and they had a laughing coach. And this stuff's been on the news, CNN, and been in different places. You can look it up on YouTube if you want to. But they would have a laughing coach that would get up in front of all these cancer patients and would coach them in laughing. Well, obviously, nobody there wants to laugh. There's nothing funny about what's going on there. But sure enough, the coach would get them up there, and they would start faking laughing. And then, you know, after a period of time, they would, they would kind of come on board, and they would be more joyful, more happy. And what they were finding was, was that people that were go to the laughing rooms, the medicine seemed to work better because as their attitude came up, as their spirit came up and the Bible says the joy of the Lord is your what? And sometimes they would, they were just starting out faking and starting out putting it on, but they were finding that this stuff was really working, but not everybody wanted to do it, right? Because it's kind of weird, right? It's not, it's like, this doesn't seem natural, But my point is, is listen, there is a strength that comes from the joy of the Lord. There is a strength that comes whenever you hook your mouth up to the possibilities of God. There's a strength that comes whenever you hook your mouth up to the word of God. There's a strength that comes whenever you says, I'm not overwhelmed, I'm overcoming. There's a strength that comes that says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The Lord is the strength of my life. I am an overcomer. If you look at the revelations at the end of the book, God talks, we think that revelations is all about the four horsemen or the seven seals. But over and over in revelations, God says, I'm writing to the overcomer. This is the overcomer. And he's just listening. And to this, this person is the overcomer. Who's the overcomer? You are. You're the overcomer. God wrote this whole book to you as the overcomer. But we have to, we got to hook our mouth up to it and we have to pull that train and we have to go that direction. I mean, y'all know that's not, it's not easy. It's very difficult. This week, a few days ago, I got a text from a young lady we've known for maybe eight years or nine years and she sent me a text and she says, uh, a loved one of mine has to go in for this procedure, and that's a high-risk procedure. This person means a lot to me, and uh, I am flooded with anxiety and worry. That was her text to me. And the minute I read it, I was just like, oh my gosh, that just hurts my heart that you're flooded with anxiety and worry. But I just knew, I was like, man, the last thing you need to say right now is I'm flooded with anxiety and worry. No, no, if you're gonna be flooded with anything, you need to be flooded with hope, 
peace, strength, life. So I texted back to her. If I had my phone, I would read it to you. But I said, don't ever, 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 ever say I'm flooded with worry and anxiety. Say this. So then I just started texting her. My God is greater than all. My God will give wisdom to the doctors. My God will bring healing. I'm flooded with peace. I'm not anxious for anything, but by everything through prayer and supplication. So I gave her this long things of like, don't say that, say this. Don't say you're flooded with anxiety. Say you're flooded with peace. So after I sent it back, then you get those little dots. How many of y'all know the little dots on your phone? You could tell where they're like thinking about whatever they're going to do. But then she texts back. She says, thank you so much. I needed that. And I'm thinking, yeah, but that's, I didn't give you my words. I gave you his words. I didn't give you my truth. I gave you his truth. All you did was line up yourself with the truth of the word of God. That's where the power's at. There's strength in life in your mouth. And instead of saying, I'm flooded with this, no, 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 say, man, I'm flooded with peace. The peace of God that passes all understanding is in me. I'm flooded with hope. There's a hope that's an anchor for my soul. So don't say this, say that. So I want to look in uh, Joshua chapter 1 because everybody in here, how many of y'all want to be successful? Right? Everybody wants to be successful. And here in Joshua chapter 1, verse number 1, it says, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, You and all this people to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. In every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you. And as I said to Moses from the wilderness and this Lebanon as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory." And no man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage. For to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to your fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. That you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law, the word of God, should not depart from your what? He says, don't let the word of God depart from your mouth. But you shall meditate. There's your mind right there. There's your brain. He said, ponder in your thoughts. Meditate in it. How often? Day and night. That you may observe to do according to all that's written in it. For then. Everybody say then. Then you shall have. Or you, sh- your, you shall make your way prosperous. And then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you, for the third time, he says, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid or dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. There's three things I want you to see here that speaking the word of God will do for you, not in a minute, but right now. Not next week. You don't have to be a preacher. You don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to be a Christian. Ten years, ten months, or ten days. Immediately, you can put the word of God in your mouth. And the Bible says certain things can happen. He said, number one, he says, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. That right now, immediately, you can resist the devil in the name of Jesus and he'll flee from you. You don't need a priest, a prophet, an evangelist. You don't need somebody that talks in tongues. You don't need nothing. Immediately, the name of Jesus in your mouth, it is a strong tower and a weapon that puts the enemy to flight. 
right now. And if you look at Jesus over and over again, Jesus was telling his disciples, he was like, come on, guys. Come on, guys, you've seen me do this, and you've seen me do this, and I did this, and then I did this. And yet, whenever Jesus, he was sleeping in the boat during the storm, you all know this. And then they came, they wake up Jesus, they say, Jesus, don't you care that we're going to die? And Jesus steps up and says, peace, be still, boom. And then the Bible says that the great calm came over the, the, the storm, right? And then Jesus turns to his guys, he says, come on, guys. How long must I be with you, O ye of little faith, right? And then we see another time whenever they come back and they say, Jesus, Jesus, the demons, they leave whenever we tell them to get out in your name. He says, come on, guys. Come on, man. I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning, of course, they're gonna listen to you in my name, right? And then he comes back and they come, they say, oh, well, we can't believe we could do this. One of the last things Jesus said before he left this planet, he said, go into all the world, preach the gospel. He says, you lay hands on the sick, they'll recover. You'll cast out devils in my name. They'll speak with new tongues. This is the great commission. Listen, Jesus was always deputizing you and I with an authority in his name that we can use to affect change in the people around us and in our own life. But your mouth is the linchpin. What goes on underneath your nose is the most important part of you. And listen, because let's say it like this. If God says walk in love, how many of y'all know you can't walk in love unless you talk in love? In other words, you can't walk in love and with your mouth be a jerk. How many of y'all know that doesn't work? Right? You can't buy your wife a bunch of flowers and then be a, a behind to her. She's going to set you straight. She's like, I don't want your flowers. Be nice with your mouth, right? How many of y'all know that you can't walk in the spirit and not talk in the spirit? It doesn't work. How many of y'all know you can't walk by faith and talk fear? Can't do it. It's impossible. You can't walk by faith and talk doubt. It doesn't work. Listen, your mouth is the key to you walking in love. It's the key to you walking in the spirit. It's the key to you walking in faith. It's the key to you walking in joy, victory, prosperity. The, your mouth is a weapon. It's a very strong, powerful tool. And listen, there's three things here that I see that the Lord told Joshua that the word of God, he says, it needs to be in your mouth. He says, you need to put it in your mouth. Meditate in it day and night. Then, uh, he says, then you'll be prosperous and have good success. The first thing that the, that the word of God did for him was comfort him. And there's times whenever we need comfort. And the Lord told Joshua, he says, Joshua, Moses is dead. And there's times in our life whenever things that are, they're painful, they're hard, they're hard to go through. But I'm telling you, the word of God will be a comfort to you. Because the word of God for, for Joshua was, number one, Moses is dead. But number two, the same way I was with Moses, I'll be with you. And sometimes we think that God is only good to, to, to certain people. Like, well, he'll only do that for a pastor, for a preacher, a teacher. Listen, Moses had... A great beard, right? He had some nice clothes, right? But there was nothing unique about Moses. What made Moses Moses was his relationship with God, not his DNA. Listen, what you do with God in this life is not about your DNA. It's about your relationship with him. And sometimes we think that, well, Moses was Moses and, and I'm way down here. God said, Moses is dead, but you got to bring the people over. But the same way I was with Moses, I'll be with you. In other words, I don't love Moses any more or any less than you. And I'm not going to anoint him to be mo any more than I'll anoint you. The same stuff that Moses had, you got. The same ability that Moses had, you got. The same anointing that Moses has, you got. Listen. We all see pastors and preachers and teachers and people that have moral failures and they run off with the secretary or they blow all the church's money, right? Because there's, but listen, your faith was never supposed to be in a Moses. Your faith is in God and God alone because people will disappoint you. Moseses, they die. And God told Joshua, he says, Moses died, but I'm gonna be with you the same way that I was with them. And he says, I'll never leave you or forsake you. 
So there's a comfort that comes whenever we take the word of God and we say, God, you said you'll never leave me. You'll never forsake me. I put my hope, my faith, my trust in you alone. The second thing that the word of God does for you, because some of you are like, man, I'm always discouraged. Put the word of God in your mouth. And it'll bring you out of a sorrowful place. And it'll, it'll say, no, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The Lord has strengthened me. The second thing he does is, is it gives you courage. Over and over and over again, he, told, he said, be strong and be very courageous. And when it comes to mental health, all of us get discouraged. Have you ever been discouraged? Discouraged means to take courage out. And life has a way of taking courage out of you. People have a way of taking courage out of you. Circumstances have a way of taking courage out of you. You fall into temptation and it takes all of your courage. And now you are discouraged. How are you going to get that courage back? He tells you, he says, take the word of God and put it in your mouth. And encourage, encourage means to put courage back in. So whenever you get discouraged and you're mentally you're whipped he says everything's taking this courage out how are you going to put it back in he says take the word of God get it in your mind and he says speak it out of your mouth Amen. you say well what well, what do I say he says this book of the law he gives you he gives you the words to say so whenever you put the word of God in your mouth it encourages you Whenever David came back to Ziglag, the Bible says that the city was burned. His wives and his women were all taken captive and they, were, they became slaves. And all of David's men got together and said, we're going to kill David because he's the cause of this, right? Because the leader always catches the brunt of it, right? Always the tip of the spear. So David, the Bible says, David has to encourage himself. David has to take the courage that was taken out of him and he has to put it back in. How do you think David encouraged himself? The Bible says, in the Lord. David's a worshiper. He knew how to get in God's presence and get some courage. David was a praiser. He knew how to get in God's presence, praise the Lord, and here comes the courage. David knew how to take the word of God because you remember whenever David uh, was, was gonna kill Goliath, his dad said, no, you're not good enough. You're not capable enough. You're too small. His brothers told him, you're too small. You're a, you know, you're, you're a nothing. We're the ones that are big and strong. Saul told him, he says, man, you're gonna need to wear my armor because you don't have what it takes to beat Goliath. No, 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 David with his mouth, he says, I don't care what my daddy says. I don't care what my brother says. I don't care what Saul says. I killed a lion, I killed a bear, and Goliath is going to be just like them. He won, he won the, the war with his mouth before he ever swung a sword. And then he told Goliath, he said, Goliath, today I'm going to feed you to the birds. Today I'm going to cut your head off and then I'm going to feed you to the birds. He was setting everybody know. He had a thousand reasons why to be totally discouraged, but he knew how to put that courage back in says the Lord delivered me from this he was faithful then he'll be faithful now he's faithful to a thousand generations he was faithful to the Moseses and to the Joshua's and I'm no better no different than them my God is faithful he's faithful he just what's he doing he's putting that courage back in there and listen for you and I this is one of the greatest things I'm telling you you'll ever learn as a Christian is if you can't win the war of words you won't win any wars if you can't win the war of words, if you can't learn how to set a guard at your mouth, and I'm still learning this, it's a tough thing because we, sometimes, I mean, I know sometimes we have more faith in cancer's ability to kill than God's ability to heal. That's just the way it is. You hear the word cancer and immediately you think dead duck. We have more faith in that than we have in God's ability to heal. Why, why is that? Because all of the world is always trying to bring you to a place of discouragement. But God gave us a way to put courage in. Yeah. It says, this book of the law, if you'll put it within your mouth, if you'll meditate in it day and night, if you'll observe to do all that's written in it, then you'll be prosperous, have good success. The third thing it does, see, it gives you courage. When you're discouraged, the word of God will put that courage back up in there. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The Lord is the strength of my life. The Lord is my shepherd I shall not want. The Lord will lead me to green pastures and still waters. Come on, what are you doing? I'm putting courage back in. And there's been times in my life where I needed some courage. 
There's been some Moses in my life that have died, dead. They are done, kaput. It's over. But the Lord would say, the same way I did it then, I'll do, I did it for them, I do it for you. I won't leave you. I won't forsake you. So then I've got to line myself up with that. So the Lord will comfort you with his word if you'll put it in your mouth. The Lord will give you strength, give you courage. The third one I see here is that wisdom comes with your words. Because the Lord told Joshua, he says, you're going to have to deal with the Hittites. There's always some people in your life, sometimes in your family, that will tell you, you're wasting your time with the Lord. He says, you're going to have to deal with the wilderness. How many of you have ever been lost before? I've been lost. I'm not, I don't have a good sense of direction. If it wasn't for Elizabeth, I told the early service, I'd still be at the airport. Right? Or I would be in Jamaica. I would be somewhere, right? Because every time we travel, I always wind up like at the wrong gate if it wasn't for her. Like, and I'm always convinced that I'm, a, I'm in the right place and I'm never in the right place. And here he told Joshua, he says, listen, you're going to have to deal with the wilderness and there's going to be an ocean there and there's going to be some rivers there and there's going to be times in your life that if you serve God long enough, there's going to be times in your life where you're wandering you're wondering, you're like, I don't know, I'm wondering, I don't, I'm not sure. But I can tell you, the Lord is a leader and a guider. And if you'll, look, if you'll hook up and say, the Lord is guiding me. I always take the right turn in the road. The Lord is the shepherd of my life. The Lord will give you supernatural wisdom. But if you're always like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to make it through this. I don't know. Listen, you do know God is living in you. And God will say, come on, man. Don't you know? Come on, man. Do you not know that you're a temple of the Holy Spirit? Do you not know that the spirit of truth lives in you? Do you not know? And if you'll hook up with that, I'm telling you, the Lord will give you supernatural wisdom. Everybody say, I have the mind of Christ. I have the thoughts, the brilliance of Christ. I mean, if we listen to the Holy Spirit, he'll make you look smart. He'll make you look a lot smarter than you are just by the, just by the Holy Spirit. The last thing, and we're going to talk about this in the next few weeks because this is such a big part of Christianity. This is the part that I've worked on the most, but it's the part that's made such a big, big deal on my life. Let me say this. If you will get 50% better with your words, if you will get 50% better with the words that you speak, you'll see a thousand percent increase in your life. I'm going to say that again. It's a money back guarantee. If you will get 50% better if you will set a guard at your mouth and stop speaking certain things and hook your speaker up to your believer and the word of God, if you will give pause, that's why the Bible says be slow to speak, right? Because we like to run off at the mouth, myself included. Let's say it like this. We think words describe something. God says words create something. So we think, well, I'm just describing my situation to you. Yeah, but God says words have creative ability. In the beginning, God created, he created man, and he said, let us make man in our image. And the Bible says man there, it means speaking spirit. So you were made in the likeness of God as a speaking spirit. And the Bible says that all of creation was created with what? The word of God. So God's given us this ability. And if you will make a 50% effort in watching the words that you say, you'll see a 1,000% return. If the way you talk to your spouse and your kids, if you'll bless instead of curse, you'll see a 1,000% return. If you'll speak words of faith instead of words of fear, you'll see a 1,000% return. God guarantees it. It's not my guarantee. God told, Moses, told Joshua here, he says, everything Moses did was not because he was special. It's because he went up to the mountain, he got with me, and I gave him my word. And he knew what to do with it. And he says, and now you've got to carry these people over. You've got to go. You've got to carry it over. And for many of you, you're the light for your family. 
Your whole family looks to you. You're the pace setter and the course setter. You're the only light in the family. And if your words will be right, I'm telling you, you can lead them to green pastures and still waters. But if your words aren't any different than anybody else's words, what do you have to offer? If you don't have any more hope than anybody else has, what do we have to offer? No, no, no. Our faith-filled words say, God is going to lead me through this. And I don't know when and I don't know how and I'm kind of wandering in a wilderness here and there's, I can't go there and I can't go that way. But God's going to lead me. God's going to direct me. God's going to help me. God's going to strengthen me. God's going to fix me. God's going to work in this. And I'm telling you, if you'll hook up with that, you'll see a thousand percent increase in your life. Your life, your marriage, your finances, there's nothing in you that this won't affect and change because all of it was made with words. Everything you see was created by what you can't see. And it was all created by the word of God. So your homework is, is, is just do what the Bible says to do here. And this is Psalms 141. Set a guard, O Lord, at my what? At my mouth. So we're going to take, 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 take the next few weeks and just work on putting a guard at our mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Why is this such a big deal? Because God said you're snared by the words of your mouth. He says your words have created a trap that you're bound up in. But if your words got you in it, his word will get you out. He says you're snared by the words of your mouth. So here the psalmist is like, Lord, help me with my mouth. Help me with my lips. Help me get this part of my life under control. And if you'll do it, you'll watch. You'll see your mental health turn around. You'll see different areas of your life. You're like, man, this is help. But this is not easy. This is hard. The Bible says no man can tame the tongue. And y'all know we just got a tiger got out loose in the suburbs of Houston a couple of days ago. How many of y'all saw that? Tiger running rampant right over there in Houston, right? And they're trying to corral that tiger. That's kind of like your mouth. You may think it's tame, but then it'll get out on you, right? It'll kind of get away from you a little bit. So we're going to practice taming the tongue because this is such a huge part of your life. Every person in here, you all got saved the same way. Every person in here, you believed in your heart and you confessed with your what? If that's not powerful, I don't know what is. Because you were going to spend an eternity in hell totally isolated from anything good for an eternity. But faith-filled words took you out of the dominion and power of an eternal hell and put you into, the Bible says, the kingdom of his dear son, into marvelous light. So how can one sentence have that much of an impact of your life? I don't know, but it did. How many of y'all glad it did? How many of y'all glad? He did the hard part, right? But he says, hey, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, I'm translating you out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son in whom you have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. All of your sins were washed away by a few words out of your mouth. It's pretty powerful. So we're going to take the next few weeks and we're going to learn to tame our tongue. And I'm still working on this. How many of y'all know we do so good on Sunday? How many of y'all do good on Sunday? We do so good on Sunday. On Sunday we praise the Lord. Oh, praise the Lord. The Lord is good. Come on, on Sundays you're full of faith. Full of the Holy Spirit. Oh, I felt it today. Oh, man, I got a zap today. Got a zing. Ooh, we're just so full of possibility. So full of praise. How many of y'all know by Wednesday we leak? Right? And our words have snared us again. And so we're going we're to practice about how to set a guard at our mouth and get better and better so that we can all have a thousand percent return. And uh, I'm a... I'm a, I'm a I'm a work in progress just like you. Let me pray for you. I didn't mean